climate change is an important um, agenda for the forestry sector. And this is exactly what the UN Red program was established to address. But um, under the UN Red Lower Mekong Initiative, we're not doing just the climate agenda. We're also noting that the sustainable forest trade is part of that, so that uh, um, equation to get to emission reductions. We noticed that drivers of deforestation and degradation have a lot to do with how sustainable forest trade, sustainable and legal forest trade go. At the beginning of this side event, I'd like to invite Dr. Pham Ban Dien, Deputy Director General of the Enforced, to answer two questions. The two questions are, at the COP26 in Glasgow last year end, Vietnam took one of the center stages in signing the Glasgow Forest Leaders Declaration and the Prime Minister, Mr. Bam Man Chin, announced a target of achieving net zero emissions by 2050. So I'd like to ask you, Dr. Dian, what are MARD's plan in the forestry sector and its contribution towards the net zero target targets? My second question, moving on from climate change, is Vietnam's forest industry. So how do you see this massive growth in your forest industry in the past decade balancing with your climate change um, targets and the forestry forestry sector's role there with? Over to you. Yes, uh, thank you so much, uh, Akiko, and uh, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, it's my uh, a pleasure to be here to share with you some uh, general information and uh, relating to the two questions uh, asked by Akiko and uh, regarding the first uh, issue I would like to share with you that uh, the commitment of our Prime Minister at the COP26 uh, to reduce emission to zero uh, by 2050 uh, has a deep roots uh, in both idea, determination, and action in Vietnam. Uh, we have had so many, many plans, but it is based on that uh, and the practical uh, context uh, in Vietnam. Uh, our Prime Minister declares the SNCLP. Yes. Uh, this commitment is a strategic choice that express Vietnam's reason, responsibility, and obligation, and strong efforts to unite with international communities to fight against climate change and environmental protection and achieve sustainable development goals. And uh, you may know the forestry-based solution become much more critical with the particular importance of forestry, which is also the only one with net emission under zero in Vietnam now. So many, many activities but only forestry sector obtain this very positive results. And forestry is now considered the green pillar for the green economies in Vietnam. And therefore, the minister, ministry plan in the forestry sector has been tried really concerned, <coughs> much more concerned. Uh, you may know uh, this is a national comprehensive and extended term plan. Uh, this plan will solve the fundamental, essential and significant challenge 
shortcomings and barriers in the development process. The critical issues of institution, <coughs> policy, strategy, planning, technology, management, business, and everything, a significant thing, will be included in the plan. The plan is expected to increase forest quality and generate about 50 million tons of CO2 per year from 2030 onward. And um, in recent year, with the bow development, uh, every year, uh, it can uh, generate about 27 to 30 million tons per year. But based on the plan, and when we put this plan into practice, it will generate the double. And you may know uh, the plan is also attractive to people to inv invest in the forest from the other fields and the sector. Mm, can move to forest for investing. Uh, investing in forest is investing in a green pillar of the national economy and accordingly decreasing emissions in other sectors will option more and more results. And we, work, we welcome all support for, from you uh, for establishing, implementing, supervising, and monitoring the plan. Yeah. And regarding the second issue, uh, you may know that the, the processing uh, industry has ended develop rapidly over the past time in Vietnam. It has been recognized as an essential factor in promoting and encouraging forest development and forest protection. Processing uh, is considered as the output of the uh, forest plantation. Yeah. And the value of wood processing and exporting will increase in the coming year. It's not stopped. Yes, the uh, total value of timber and uh, wood and wood product exporting uh, about 15 billion US dollar. But this will increase in coming year. At the same time, we close the door of natural forests I talk very simple for you to understand it. No any logging in the natural forest allowed in Vietnam now and in coming year. We close all doors of natural forest for uh, conservation, reservation for the next future. Yes. And we also um, develop the planted forest in the sustainable way. And uh, just means that uh, all value chains, including domestic and global chains, value chains, will be traced, developed, and balanced sustainably. Forestry is model and bears the, the heavy responsibility for the net zero targets in Vietnam. In practice, you can see that our forest resource, resources have enriched and improved in the recent last 10 years. For example, while much more value from timber processing and exporting, we can gain. This evidence is a practical foundation for integrating multi-value on the same forest 
stand simultaneously. Thank you so much. Thank you, Dr. Dan. A sustainable forest trade journey is what you're going to experience. We have four stops that we want to take you through. Endangered species, trends in China, social environmental data, and smallholders and forest investments. The journey is starting now. We'd like to start by taking a closer look at the truly incredible biodiversity that can be found in the Lower Mekong region. So uh, the region contains some of the most biologically diverse habitats in the world. It's also one of the largest tiger habitats uh, in the world. It accounts for 25% of the global freshwater catch. And it hosts more than 20,000 plant species, including some really rare and unique tree species. And in fact, we're still learning about the biodiversity in the Lower Mekong. Just last January, they, they released a really interesting report that listing 224 new species coming from the, the Mekong region. This biodiversity is under intense threat due to the uh, amazing social and economic development in the region, but also pressure from the, the growing Chinese market. And CITES, the Convention on International Trade and in Indigenous Species in Wild Fauna and Flora, uh, works with governments to ensure that international trade does not threaten the survival of species. In China, there's a, a new article, Article 65, that was enacted in July 2020. And this will prohibit the um, import of illegal wood into China. Chinese demand is changing fast. It's rapidly growing and urbanizing. And, you know, it, it's 1.4 billion customers. And so the, the decisions that these consumers are making in terms of what they, what they buy, what they eat, uh, what you consume and you know, what furniture they buy, what, what how they build the houses has direct impact on regions like like the Mekong. It's very important to track social environmental in outcomes in the forest sector um, to understand you know how the ecosystems are changing and but also what the most appropriate policy actions are. There are actually a range of, of, of platforms, data, and tools that can assist in monitoring and analyzing environmental data. What we're seeing is that navigating among this increasing long list of resources can be challenging for countries, for governments. We also have to recognize that local communities have their own issues that they want to monitor. And it may not be the same as what a national forest monitoring system looks like or is providing. Fourth stop, smallholders. The Lower Mekong, if we talk about forests, it's really about the smallholders. They ultimately are managing so much of the forest. We uh, at UNEP like to see uh, farmers and smallholders as entrepreneurs in, in the making, uh, essentially. And we're seeing that while there are some technical barriers, also in many cases, uh, smallholders basically lack the basic business skills to turn their livelihoods into genuine businesses that generate profits and create jobs. This was our last stop in the journey, Akiko. Should we, should we take some questions? Thanks, thank you much, guys. This, was, this is a really interesting way of presenting it. I, 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 was, um, I was interested to hear about the, particularly the, the trends in China, the way that's developing, uh, particularly the way that the, uh, the certification or the, the markets for certified timber and the markets for, for sustainable products in China are developing uh, internally, yeah, with the, uh, with the changing you know, population dynamics there. Um, and uh, yeah, it'd be interesting to hear also from, from, from FSC, I think Cindy's still here, yeah, um, about what she thought about the, uh, I thought, yeah, you surprised me, I surprised her, yeah. Um, um, so yeah, it'd be interesting to hear what, what Cindy thinks uh, about the, the, the lessons that you presented here and the, the figures uh, that you found out and whether this, this chimes with her experience. China is definitely a very key component in this um, Mekong initiative because of the trade link. And just now early on, um, when Akiko uh, mentioned about a couple of years ago, it's like 12,000. And just like, um, I mean, I, when you just mentioned, I, it's like 
put up my computer and the latest uh, data as of um, April um, two weeks ago is uh, short 32 short of 15,000. So by today, uh, I can almost guarantee it's beyond 15,000 because literally on the month to month tracking, on average, we get about two to 300 increase in COC. And that's in the chain of custody. And why this figure is going up, and you can see that it's like, you know, the, it's the operation, the manufacturing, the processing. So the material coming from Lo Kong into China, getting into the process, getting the manufacturing. So that's how that COC growing so fast. So, um, that, I mean, uh, definitely, that's why um, uh, FSC's investment in this region is also focused very heavily in China. We're seeing humongous growth there. And then, uh, and also the China linking actually all over the place. I mean, Mekong is one of the key places. And we are like for that, um, we're putting special resources in uh, our value chain and looking at that. So for from questions, I have um, I have one quick question and one small observation. Quick question. Um, now we know that the countries in the Mekong are uh, um, uh, connected via commodity trades and the trade data recorded by each country are very much different. So I would like to ask whether the project has been looking into that into the in terms of data gaps among different countries in the Mekong. The you know, observation, we know that the, the invasion of Russia on uh, Ukraine has a huge impact on global uh, timber supplies. Um, every year, China will be missing about 10 million uh, cubic meters of timber from Russia, basically disruption of that supply chain. And it will have a huge impact on the resource in the Mekong region. Have you looked into that as well? Have you factored that kind of emerging reason into the overall landscape? Well, you're talking about trade data, right? Trade, trade deal. Yeah. Yeah. Well, you know, we haven't quite gotten there yet. One of the the things that we are trying to address is to understand about illegal logging, and you know, it's 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 almost a an oxymoron. You, you there is no definition or a statistics on illegal logging by the nature of what it is, right? So we're trying to use proxy data to figure out what the trends are. Certification, if it increases, hopefully that means reduced illegal, right? Um, if there is more robust customs data that match with, you know, the the, the import export countries, hopefully that means more increased sustainable or, or legal. Um, so we're trying to pull together the different types of data, be it forest cover, forest trade, um, biodiversity. Yeah, we're, we're not quite there yet, but we do have an intention of trying to bring data sets together from different angles of forestry, putting it together with the government and trying to figure out what it says altogether in terms of what the implications for illegal logging. So I thought maybe you want to, to talk about uh, the first question. He talked about, you know, there's FLECT, there's LAF, there's NDF. What are the smallholders going to do? That's a lot of additional additional tasks. And I thought, unless somebody really wants to, I thought maybe I could ask Richard to comment on the second question. You don't want to come on the first question? Well, I can't come on the first question. <laughs> yes, I, I think you're very uh, right. It's that, I mean, the, the, the demand for CITES, for legal, for sustainable, FSC, PFC, this is something that is there. A farmer cannot change, there is or there is, and, and they're asking all these things. What governments can do is to encourage compatibility between systems, yeah? To encourage, if you do this, you also do that, it's the same or it's compatible, systems are compatible. So depending on where you want to send your product, uh, the government can make it easy or encourage at least recognition between systems. The trend is that people don't work together. Yeah, You have FSC, PFC, uh, FLEC license and CITES. Um, that's the easiest way. And I'm, I'm saying it's, it's complicated to work together, but in the interest of, of producers, I think it's worth trying a little bit more. For, 
I think we could learn from India with the Dalbergia that's planted widely by the smallholders. The CITES has designated the PFC member, the NCCF, the, the, um, the National Conservation and Certification Foundation. They, uh, they give the CITES um, verification with a self-declaration. So it's quite easy for planted Dalbergia to be able to be traded. And, and I have planted a few um, of, of the rosewoods in, in Laos, and I'm not sure how we're going to sell them. Um, a, another comment about the big investors in Cambodia, I think I agree with your, some of your theme there was a lot of this is um, probably niche, small forestry industry when there's actually big investors like New Forests or Vietnam Rubber Group or Store Enso um, that are going into the Lower Mekong region. And it's those organizations that can change a landscape um, and take the risk off the smallholders by setting up um, the good genetics, the good techniques, the, the good policy and the markets, and then the smallholders can follow and so I think that's um, something that we missed. And I wanted to try and get a video into this session about a company that buys 30% of Vietnam's wood chip. Um, and what they want to do is, is, is large scale verification. And they're finding the costs of the current approach to certification is, is inappropriate, inappropriate for their production. Um, and then my last comment, or, or, and it's interesting about the rubber wood going, well, the first thing is interesting is going from natural forest to plantations. And we're still taking flag tea and even standards like PFC and FSC are very much orientated from natural forest, complex, um, multi-purpose production systems compared to a rubber plantation. And that's why PFCs develop the trees outside forest standard to take some of the magic pudding out of a smallholder's backyard and not trying to deliver the full suite of sustainability um, elements at, at, at a single site level. However, I think of the three and a half million hectares of rubber wood that produces two million tons or two million cubic meters of sawn timber, the, the largest amount of tropical sawn timber traded between Thailand and China. I, I think there would be less than 10,000 hectares certified. And, and I think that this is symbolic of a two-tiered economy that we are creating between these NGOs and the ODAs wanting to fine tune a top 10% of a green economy. Some people want to call it a gold standard and then we're pushing the rest into the black economy. And, and the 2 million hectares of rubber wood that's going into, into China, I, I know it's not certified, but it probably is getting called controlled source or something because of its low risk character. Um, but it's just a matter of understanding the, the change in the whole forest sector. And I think the need to recognize that we are dealing with plantation production systems, mainly in Southeast Asia. And if we want to get what this project aims for, which is 10% of the volume traded from Lao Mekong to be sustainable or legal, it's working with that 2 million cubes going from Thailand to China, or it's working with the, the 10 million cubes of wood chip going from Vietnam, where, where we have to decriminalize these small forest owners, which are the backbone a very big industry. And, and this is a challenge for us all. And, and we, we need to have the big guys in, in the conversations which have been pushed into the, into the black market while we're working on the edges in somewhat niche production systems. I've actually been um, sitting here thinking that I, I've, um, I've really enjoyed this session that it's, I love the fresh approach that you've taken to it and that has actually ended up with some time for some discussion. That's the main thought, apart from feeling very tired. Um, 
I guess, uh, I mean, it's not actually completely related, but uh, I mean, I, I still think there's this, com I mean, something that occupies my mind quite a lot is um, the increasing demand for forest products and where our understanding of what that looks like and where it's all going to come from. And we all know that small, as Richard's just touched on, that smallholders really are the backbone of that globally. Um, and yet in some of these really critical areas, um, certificate, their, their capacity to access certification and benefit from that, their capacity to access data around um, product demand and therefore, I guess the, um, you know, so they can make an informed decision about whether or not they do or don't invest in forests is so severely lacking. And yet our industry depends on them. And I, you know, there's still just, I guess, so much um, work to do. Um, and I guess the other thing that often occupies my mind um, in this, this interesting smallholder space is um, uh, this weird sort of combination of, you know, I, I sort of interact with both the biggest corporates and then think about smallholders. And, you know, where I'm from in Australia, some of this, these questions, they, they don't think about it that much so there's still this kind of division you know on the one hand the globe is very dependent on smallholders and yet the industry in some of those big forest producing countries sort of the, the, the tops of industry aren't necessarily thinking about some of these issues so there's just yeah I guess there's still so many complex um, complexities that we need to deal with but um, yeah there's some of my overarching thoughts for me uh, I I would just want to echo some things I said at the investment forum uh, earlier during the Congress. And this is just the my closing thoughts just following on something Richard also said about the corporates. So I, I find that we are we come together every few years, whether it's at COFO or at a Congress, but it's the same people that come to this Congress and we always are limited in the private sector actors that come. I mean, David Brand is here, was on that panel, but for the most part, Stora Enzo's are not here. Sapi's uh -huh. not here. Huh? Oh, I'm just gonna... I'm it's sure... It's a very interesting thing, especially when I was going to get that time yesterday. Yeah. I, I, I would hope that as we start talking about smallholders and that the corporates, you know, recognize their importance to their supply chain. And a lot of them, um, in whether it's in the Mekong or in Indonesia, definitely recognize the backbone that smallholders provide. So, you know, I kept saying uh, a few days ago, and next to David Brand, that local people are and should be the, the center of recovery, of, of a, a green economy, but also as we come out of uh, the economic crisis and the, now the inflationary crisis that we're seeing around the world, uh, local people need to be engaged in part of this solution because they are really the backbone of these economies. And, um, you know, the, the consumer trends are there for China, but I, I, I see as the lower Mekong region starts to also get wealthier and wealthier that the, the um, the pressure on our our forests is increasing. Uh, it's now ironic that in the old days, you know, building a house from wood was not a sign of, of wealth. It was, you know, you had your house on on stilts and that was to get, get you out of the flood zone. But then, you know, a trend was to build your house with cement. And now the trend is to build your house again with wood and to use, you know, very nice wood at that. So we're, we're seeing consumer demand shifting. Uh, we're seeing that in, in the urban centers, but we're also seeing that in, in rural areas. And uh, one of the slides from a, our speaker was about social capital. 
you know, we need the social cohesion at the local level. We need these communities to effectively have ability to enter the market and to stay in the market. Otherwise, they will leave or they will produce something else at, at, at the expense of the forest. So that's just my closing thought. Thank you.